Chronicles, first book, chapter 16. We've seen the last time how the ark was brought on Mount Zion, and now we have the psalm David composed in connection with this in verse 7. Um, verse 7 of chapter 16. Then on that day, David delivered first this psalm to give thanks to Jehovah through Asaph and his brethren. Give thanks unto Jehovah, call upon his name, make known his acts among the peoples. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, meditate upon all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek Jehovah, seek Jehovah and his strength, seek his face continually. Remember his wondrous works which he has done, his miracles and the judgments of his mouth, ye seed of Israel his servant, ye sons of Jacob his chosen ones. He, Jehovah, is our God. His judgments are in, are in all the earth. Be ever mindful of his covenant. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which he made to his Abram and of his oath unto Isaac, and he confirmed it unto Jacob for a statute, unto Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of our inheritance, when you were a few men in number, of small account, and strangers in it, and they went from nation to nation, and from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to oppress them, and reproved kings for their sake, saying, Touch not mine anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. Sing unto Jehovah all the earth, publish his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the nations, his wondrous works among all peoples, for Jehovah is great, and exceedingly to be praised. He is terrible above all gods. Verse 34. Give thanks unto Jehovah, for he is good, for his loving kindness endures forever. And say, Save us, O God, of our salvation, and gather us and deliver us from the nations, to give thanks unto thy holy name, to triumph in thy praise. Blessed be Jehovah, the God of Israel, from eternity and to eternity. And all the people said, Amen, and praised Jehovah. And he left there before the ark of the covenant of Jehovah, Asaph and his brethren, to do the service before the ark continually, as every day's duty required. And Obedidom and their brethren, 68, Obedidom also the son of Jeduthun, and Hosea as doorkeepers. And Zadok, Zadok the priest, and his brethren the priests, before the tabernacle of Jehovah, in the high place that was at Gibeon, to offer a burnt offerings to Jehovah on the altar of burnt offering continually, morning and evening, and according to all that is written in the law of Jehovah, which he commanded Israel. And with them Heman and Jeduthun and the rest that were chosen, who were expressed by name to give thanks to Jehovah, because his loving kindness endures forever. And with them, with Heman and Jeduthun, trumpets and cymbals for those that should sound aloud, and the musical instruments of God. And the sons of Jeduthun were at the gate. And all the people departed, every one to his house, and David returned to bless his household. And it came to pass, as David dwelt in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I dwell in a house of cedars, and the ark of the covenant of Jehovah under curtains. And Nathan said to David, Do all that is in thy heart, for God is with thee. It came to pass that night that the word of God came to Nathan saying go and say to David my servant thus saith Jehovah thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in for I have not dwelt in a house since the day that I brought up Israel to this day but I have been from tent to tent and from one tabernacle to another in all my going about with Israel with all Israel did I speak a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people saying why built ye me not a house of cedars and now, thus shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, I took thee from the pasture grounds, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. 
And then verse 10. In the middle of verse 10. And I will subdue all thine enemies. And I tell thee that Jehovah will build thee a house. And it shall come to pass when thy days are fulfilled that thou must go to be with thy fathers that I will set up thy seed after thee which shall be of thy sons and I will establish his kingdom. It is he who shall build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son and I will not take away my mercy from him as I took it from him that was before thee. And I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak to David. And King David went in and said before Jehovah, and said, Who am I, Jehovah Elohim? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? Verse 19, Jehovah, for thy servant's sake, and according to thine own heart, hast thou done all this greatness, to make known all these great things. Jehovah, there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like thy people Israel? Then verse 22, and thy people Israel hast thou made thine own people forever. And thou, Jehovah, art become their God. And now, Jehovah, let the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house be established forever, and do as thou hast said. Let it even be established, and let thy name be magnified forever, saying, Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, is God to Israel. And let the house of David, thy servant, be established before thee. For thou, my God, hast revealed to thy servant that thou wilt build him a house, Therefore, has thy servant found in his heart to pray before thee. And now, Jehovah, thou art that God, and hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. And now, let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may be before thee forever. For thou, Jehovah, hast blessed it, and it shall be blessed forever. So far the reading of the scriptures. Well, this is a long portion we have before us, and uh, it may be good to remind ourselves of a few things we have seen so far. This is the last book in the Hebrew Bible, the last book of the Old Testament. And in that sense, it has a very important place and connects immediately with the New Testament. Um, We see there the history of Israel as God likes to think of it. We see there God's purpose with his uh, people. In our prayer, we have thought of this Desire Jabez had to have his portion enlarged in the land. And so we have seen that these things are written for our admonition. All these things, the Old Testament, according to 1 Corinthians 10, have a very special meaning for us. And so God has introduced us into a heavenly land where the Lord Jesus is now crowned with glory and honor. And so we see here not only the history of Israel in the past, as God likes to look at it, but we see also an illustration. Uh, It's God's lesson book, as it were, to show us what his thoughts are for us now, in connection with the true David, with the David, the king after his heart. And also, we have thought of a prophetic meaning of this book. There are things we can find which would apply to the future, when Israel will be restored in their land, We see the preparations of this in a sense today when the temple will be built, not the temple of the Antichrist, but the temple of God according to Ezekiel. So there are many things we find in these chapters which are really prophetic in that sense. Give illustrations of what is going to happen in the millennium. So an important book. And we have seen that God focuses the attention attention of his people on the man of his choice. Seeing that God has set aside the first man the line of Adam. And God introduces a second man according to his heart. That is very important to see. We have seen that God's uh, attention then focuses on a special tribe, Judah. And in this tribe, the man after his heart, David, 
And so we have also seen many practical lessons for overcomers. God wants overcomers. They were living in days after the captivity when this book was written. And the people of God in those days would look back now, when they were were living in very difficult days, they would look back through this writer of the book of Chronicles to the early days where it was so wonderful to live under David and Solomon. How would these people rejoice when they would listen to the word of God when it would be read to them? They would be so happy when they would think back of these days of the past. And then they would look at themselves and they would perhaps be discouraged. But then the the reader would say, but notice, this is also what God has in mind for his people in the future. And so they would be happy again. You see? This is a very wonderful book also for us. God wants us to be overcomers in a day of ruin. These people were living in a day of ruin, day of decline, of small things. They had gone back to Jerusalem. The temple had been rebuilt. But it was in smallness compared with these glorious days of the past and also compared with the glorious days of the future. And so we have seen the importance of the king after God's heart who would set up the things according to God's thoughts. We have noticed also that this king is also a priest according to God's ideas. Now, in the Old Testament, the king never could be a priest, literally. The king, David, was from Judah. The priests were from Levi. But we have seen that these things are also an illustration of the Lord Jesus, who is the true king-priest, the true Melchizedek, who will unite these both elements in himself. And that is the case today. Our Lord Jesus is the true king of righteousness, the true king of peace. He is in heaven, crowned with glory and honor. He is also the true priest there, the great high priest, not only to take care of our needs, but also to be the minister in the sanctuary. There we have the true David. Well, that that shows how these uh, lessons are so important for us, because we see more through these things of what the Lord Jesus is in a day where his people is uh, in reproach where there is much weakness and smallness of things much ruin we have noticed that these uh, genealogies are also fragments really and so the people of God is fragmented but we have noticed that there is a line going through these chapters where we see God's line as it were with his people so we have noticed the idea of the priesthood connected with the king according to God's heart. And that brings us to the house of God. We will, we have noticed a few verses now tonight we read uh, how important the house of God is for God and how God would build that house through a descendant of David. And so the remainder of this book and also in 2 Chronicles will mainly deal with this subject of the house of God. Now before we get there we have seen how In order to build a house, God would attract the faithful among his people to the king of his choice. You see how they came from every side, even from the tribe of Benjamin. So I cannot repeat what we have seen in chapter 12, but that is very touching. And it would be a challenge for us also to be attracted to the king of God's choice, even when he is in rejection. And then we have seen when David was acknowledged by the people how he had this desire to bring the ark to Zion. Why is the ark so important? Why is Zion so important? Um, A young lady here last time asked me after the meeting, what what is really the meaning of the ark? We had talked about the ark a lot. And then I said, you see, the easiest thing to understand is when you compare it with the throne. The ark is God's throne. And you know, so often in our lives, we want to be on the throne. But what was David's exercise? That the Lord would be on the throne. That was the importance of getting the ark in Zion. And why is Zion so important? Because that has to do with the place of God's choice. God had chosen a place where he would dwell among his people. Deuteronomy 12. I mentioned also Psalm 132. And so what you see now in David, all these lines fall into place. God's desire was to bless his people that is already since the days of Abraham in connection with with, uh, Israel of course Uh, then God wanted to dwell among his people 
And in order to dwell among his people, there had to be the right order of things. And that is why the king comes in. You can see that in Psalm 132. So the king, according to God's heart, set up everything according to God's ideas. He made God the center of everything. Not man. And the soul, self was on the throne. Man was the center of everything. Under David, God is the head. God is the center. And so, there we see that all these things come together. The ark is God's throne. And David acknowledges the rights of God and puts God, as it were, in the midst of his people. Now, this is very important for us today to give the Lord his due place in the midst of his people. To acknowledge his lordship, although he is a rejected lord. To acknowledge his headship. How many would really depend on the head? This is what we have in these illustrations. And also, it's a matter of the grace of God. Sovereign grace. When you think about Zion, you think of God's counsel, but you also think of God's sovereign grace. Uh, as far as the people was concerned, there was utter failure under the days of Saul. The ark had even been forgotten. Nobody talked about the ark. But then we have noticed last time there was a young man. And there are young men and women here now amid. Children, would you cherish the Lord in your heart? Would you love the Lord? I remember a story of a young boy in England. Maybe he was three years old. I, I don't remember exactly the age he had when this happened. And he had heard about the Lord Jesus. That the Lord Jesus had no place to rest, to lay his head. When he went to bed, he put himself just at the edge of his bed. And then the next morning his mother found him there and she said, David, why were you sleeping on the edge of the bed? And he said, you know, I did it because I wanted to give a place to the Lord Jesus. When he would come, then at least he would have a place in my room. Isn't that nice? So, does the Lord Jesus have a place in your room? in your heart, in your home. That is David's exercise, to give the Lord his due place. Now we have seen that David failed in the way he brought up the ark. And so he had to learn many lessons. We have seen that the last time. But I want you to notice now how all these things come together. The man of God's choice, who is the anointed one, who is the one uh, who is going to put into practice really God's thoughts and God anoints him for this but it's also an exercise on behalf of the people to give him that place and if you see all these things together you see that all these details speak of the Lord Jesus in a different way it's like with the sacrifices when you study the sacrifice you see all these different sacrifices they speak of the Lord Jesus then you see the offerer he was the one who presented this to God then you look the priest who took the blood and, blood and presented it uh, in the presence of God he is the priest and so everything speaks of him and this is the case also here there is no more wonderful illustration of the Lord Jesus as the ark in the Old Testament that really presents the greatness of his person God found a resting place I was speaking of the ark as a throne God found a resting place in him God dwelled in him Colossians 1 verse 19 the fullness it pleased the fullness to dwell in him. And even now in the glory, God, the Trinity, dwells in the Lord Jesus. So he is the ark. And also in connection with the matter of propitiation. The blood was applied on the ark. We find that also in connection with the ark. But then he's also the true David who would introduce the ark into the, in the midst of the people of God. That God would have his rightful place in the midst of his people. And that prepares the scene for the house. And next time, Lord, uh, Lord willing, we will see what was necessary to lay the foundations of the house. We have first the sacrifice which was necessary. We see that a failure on behalf of the people, but I don't want to speak too much about that. But just that you will see the connection between the choice God made, the chosen one, the anointed one, the one who brings up the ark. And this all prepares the scene then for God's house. God wants to dwell with his people. And the order of God's house we hope to see in more detail later on in this book. And I connect this now with the kingdom of God. So God would have his king. And today, who is the king according to God's heart? It is the Lord Jesus. Where is he? In heaven. But we are here on this earth. And God wants him to have 
his rightful place in our lives, in our hearts, in our midst, and then he will maintain God's rights in testimony in a world where God is rejected. It's not a time yet to set up everything as it will be in the millennium, that every knee will be forced to bow for him. It's now the day of rejection. And so it's a matter of the affection of the people of God to give suit to this appeal and to prepare everything for God. And so we can also uh, connect much of the teaching in Chronicles with the kingdom of God as we find it in the New Testament now, where the king is rejected and also absent in a sense, where things have been uh, entrusted into the hands of men. And so then the exercise becomes very important. What are we doing with the Lord things in the day of the absence of the king? What are we doing as servants? Do we give him this place by faith, out, out of love? Then things can fall into uh, place. So we learn many lessons then, as we have seen in chapter 13 and 15. And that brings us then to this song of praise we have in chapter 16. And we read part of this tonight. So, in chapter 16, we see how David brought the ark of God, set it in the midst of a tent. It's still provision, uh, pr uh, provisionally. It's not the definite fulfillment of God's thoughts yet. That will be in the millennium. But today also, we may give this place to the Lord Jesus. And there we have seen the burnt offerings, the peace offerings. We've seen uh, things Godward and manward, fellowship. We have seen how the people was blessed. And uh, in verse 3 also, and we have uh, reminded ourselves of the truths we find in Romans 14, verse 17, where we have now the kingdom of God, which is, um, I'll just read that verse, is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That is the kingdom of God today. And that... Uh, of that we have a wonderful illustration here in 1 Chronicles 15. Of this righteousness, there is a king who maintains God's rights. We have seen it in Psalm 132. That was his burning desire that God would have his rightful place. Secondly, we have seen peace. You cannot have peace without righteousness. There has to be a righteous foundation. And then, thirdly, the joy here in the Holy Spirit. Of course, what we have is in a much wider sense and more and deeper also but we have the illustrations here in the Old Testament now we come to verse 4 where we have the Levites appointed we did not read that first Chronicles 16 verse 4 we are now and we find that the Levites were appointed for several tasks and may I ask you a question who did appoint you and me we have all tasks as servants, as Levites, in the kingdom of God. Each one of us has a task. In 1 Corinthians 12, we see it is through the Holy Spirit, who is God himself, who has authority to establish every member in the body of Christ. And so, we are also under the leadership of the true David, who would appoint each one of us for different tasks in connection with the ark. You know, it's so important to... Um, fix our eyes on the ark when did things go wrong in the history of Israel when they they would turn away from the ark and I repeat that it's so important when in Numbers in the book of Numbers the ark is in the middle of the people Moses asked one day to his brother-in-law he said you know can you come with us and show us the way through the wilderness even Moses forgot the importance of the ark and God takes up the challenge God says he doesn't say anything to Moses but God sends the ark in front of the people. The ark was supposed to be in the middle. Six tribes here, then the ark, and then six tribes to follow. But then God says, I'll put the ark in front. And so Moses got his lesson. The ark is the all-important uh, guide, uh, guide. You see, they had the trumpets, as we have also the word of God to listen to. They had the clouds to follow. But then the ark was there for the heart and we need it we need ears to listen to the word of God we need eyes to see the glory of the Lord Jesus but we also need the ark for our hearts to follow him through the wilderness here we are not in the wilderness of course here we are in the land 
But there we are, we need the ark too. The Lord Jesus is the center of heaven. Everything is centered around him. And now we are here on this earth as Levites to be here to serve God in connection with the ark, to give him his rightful place. That is Matthew 18, verse 20. And so when our eyes are away from the Lord, then things will go wrong, as even happened with Moses. And you find many other examples in the history of Israel that he did not give the ark his rightful place. We have reminded ourselves of the days of Eli. The ark was taken away, Ichabod. The glory was gone. And notice here in verse 4, to do the service before the ark of Jehovah and to remem- to celebrate. It, the word really means to remember or to commemorate, to call to mind. When do we do that in a special way? When we have the Lord's Supper. We remind ourselves of him. There's a commemoration. There's a calling to mind of him. That is what these Levites do here. And to thank and to praise. You see, there are these four elements to do service before the ark. Every one of us has service. But do we do this service in connection with the ark? That's the great challenge. Or do we do it on our own initiative, according to our own ideas? Or do we do it in connection with the ark? When we celebrate, remember him. Is it to remind ourselves of our past, how bad we were? Or is it to remind ourselves of what the Lord Jesus is? how he came in to save us, and so on, to bring us to God. And then to give thanks, uh, and to praise. The word praise, really, uh, we find back in hallelujah. We'll come back to that in a moment. Jehovah, the God of Israel. Now you will say, we don't have anything to do with this, because this is Jehovah, the God of Israel. I beg your pardon. These are illustrations. Yes, we, we don't belong to the covenant God had with Abram in that sense. We are not physical descendants, or most of us, uh, not physical descendants of Abram. But God has brought us into these things. And Abram is the father of all believers. Therefore we have to do with these things. In uh, verse 5, we see the instruments used. Lutes and harps. And Asaph is always found in connection with the ark. Symbols. And uh, sometimes we wonder, why, why don't we have all these instruments here in the meeting? Because you and I, we are the instrument. We are the ten-stringed instruments. The Holy Spirit would use us as instruments to produce this wonderful music to, for the ear of God. Not for the flesh, but for the ear of God. And then notice in verse 6, there were also priests with trumpets. The trumpets have to do with public proclamation. You remember the ark uh, in front of Jericho? There were these trumpets, the priest also. So a priestly company carrying the ark, and they proclaimed the victory of the Lord. So here they are found before the ark of the covenant. Now here everything is set in order now, although it is in a provisional way as we've seen. And in that context we find David now delivering this psalm. To give thanks to Jehovah through Asaph. So Asaph was in front of the ark, the closest to the ark, and... Here we have a few details. Perhaps we can go over a few points now of this psalm. It's a little bit difficult tonight because we have um, not so many historical details now. We have more uh, spiritual things. So let's ask the Lord to help us that we may see something of this. Now just a general uh, remark in connection with these psalms. This song is composed of different psalms. And they are all taken from the fourth book of Psalms. I I, I just mentioned this. There are five books of Psalms. Like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. You have also five books of Psalms. And they go parallel with the five books of Moses. In this fourth book, we find how God introduces the man of his choice among the people of God. Really, the fourth book is also prophecy. Hebrews 1 says that God will introduce the firstborn into this universe. And numbers, uh, the fourth psalm book speaks of the introduction of God's man into this universe. But we don't have to wait till that day. God wants us to have him in our midst already now. So through this psalm we see how God would introduce the beloved in the midst of his people. 
And these, are, these things are also based on the unconditional promises God had made to Abraham. Again, in this book, we find much emphasis on the promises of God, the counsel of God. Middle of verse 8, make known his acts among the peoples. See, Israel is God's lesson book. The lessons Israel had to learn are also important for all the nations. So it will be in the millennium. In the millennium, the nations of the earth will see God's greatness in connection with, with, with what he has wrought in Israel. And verse 9 continues that thought, meditate upon all his wondrous works. Verse 10, glory in his holy name, let the heart of them rejoice that seek Jehovah. And this appeal then, seek Jehovah and his strength. This is what David had done. He had sought the ark even when, when he was a young lad. The word strength often refers to the ark. And you find this word strength also back in a name like Boaz. Boaz, in him is strength, or he is my strength. So it's wonderful to see the ark of God's strength. There is where God's strength is manifested. As you see in Jericho, when the walls of Jericho fell, God's power was manifested in the ark. And so it is important for us to seek his face continually. When Moses asked God this question, show me thy glory, then God passed and then he saw the hinder parts. God could not reveal himself in fullness as he did through the Lord Jesus now. But we may seek his face continually. Seek his presence and rejoice in him. We see God's glory in the face of the Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. Verse 12. Remember his wondrous works which he has done. His miracles and the judgments of his mouth. So all the details here are important. You can meditate upon what God would speak. One word from his mouth is so important. It is food for our souls. But it is also to settle every question. In verse 13, ye seed of Israel, his servant, his, ye sons of Jacob, his chosen ones, he, Jehovah, is our God. So he focuses here the attention of the God of the promises. And we find also that the Lord Jesus now is, um, okay, in him all God's promises are accomplished. So God is the originator of all the promises, and in the Lord Jesus we see the fulfillment there is no promise of God which is fulfilled outside of the Lord Jesus. He is the one through whom God fulfills the, prof the promises. And he is also the basis for the fulfillment of God's promises. So this uh, fourth psalm book is very uh, fitting to this. Because there we see also many references to the ark. God who would uh, be seated among the cherubim. In many psalms, uh, in the fourth psalm book, you find references to that. Uh, and so we see how God introduces his beloved one among his people and also among the nations. In verse 16, which he made with Abram. So here he refers to God's covenant and God's faithfulness in connection with Abram, Isaac and Jacob. And to Israel, an everlasting covenant. God's a covenant keeping God. And you would say, well, again, there's nothing for us in this. But in the New Testament, we see that we have the blessings of the New Covenant. The blood of the Lord Jesus, the blood of the New Covenant. So we have many things uh, in connection with this. Uh, Paul calls himself servant of the new, new Covenant. So the blessings of the New Covenant are already our own. Then we have also things which go beyond the blessings of the Covenant. We have been brought into the new creation already. But that's a subject in itself. You can uh, meditate upon that. In verse 19, he goes back to the history, how God had shown his faithfulness to a few, and they had grown in number. God had kept them. And he had even reproved kings for their sakes. So we see here an overview of God's dealings with Israel, God's grace and protection. But then in verse 23, he goes over to a different psalm, Psalm 96. What we had so far is really mainly uh, quoted, or we find it back also in Psalm 105, which is also at the end of this fourth book of Psalms. But here it goes back to the early Psalms in uh, the fourth book of the Psalms, Psalm 96. 
which has to do with the introduction of his king into this world. You can compare it with Psalm 96. And now I wanted to mention this point in connection with Hallelujah. Later on in the Psalms, 104 and further on, you find Hallelujah. And the word Hallelujah has to do with God's praise, but you see there is a connection with the millennium. When the millennial reign will start, then the whole universe will give praise to God. Hallelujah. But our privilege, it is today already, when these things are not seen yet, when God's glory is not established yet on this earth, to bring hallelujah to him. In the New Testament, in Revelation 19, you have in one chapter four times hallelujah. And it is connected there with um, the glory of the Lord Jesus and the glory of God. So we acknowledge his glory already in a scene where it is not publicly established yet. But the Psalms, on the other hand, speak of the moment that this will be done publicly and every knee will bow to him. So he speaks about God's glory, about God's greatness, about God's majesty in verse 27 and splendor, strength, again a reference to the ark, and gladness. So you can think about these verses in more detail. And then the challenge in verse 29, give unto Jehovah the glory of his name, bring an oblation and come before him, worship Jehovah in holy splendor, or in uh, there are different verses or different translations which uh, would put it in a slightly different way but it is good for us to see it's our prerogative our privilege to fall down now before him in holy splendor we find this same uh, in several psalms but my suggestion would be for us it's now in Romans 12 and many other passages especially in Ephesians and Colossians we see how we can worship the Lord now in holy splendor and so in the verses which follow uh, he speaks about how these things will be established and the Lord will reign verse 31 let them say among the nations Jehovah reigneth even in David's day it was not the case yet and in the days of the remnant when this book was written it was not the case yet but they looked forward to that moment that this would happen and the fact that the ark was among the people with David was a uh, pre-taste already like the transfiguration on the mount the transfiguration on the mount you see the glory of the millennium uh, previewed as it were in reality but it's a preview and so you have here a preview of the millennial reign in these verses Jehovah reigns um, now when you come to verse 34 uh, we find here an, a quote of another psalm that is the last psalm of this fourth book, 106. And it connects itself immediately with Psalm 107. And the expression is this, For his loving kindness endures forever. This is a verse which is quoted many, many times. It's quoted again a second time here in uh, chapter 16 by Heman and Jeduthun. So, first of all, it's quoted in connection with the service of the ark done by Asaph. And then, we'll come back to that in a moment, the service going on on Gibeon. But then later on, we find it when the altar was uh, placed again on its foundation in the days of Ezra, the priests quote the same verse. They say, for his loving kindness endures forever. If it was not for the loving kindness of God, where would we be today? Where would Israel, the remnant, have been in those days? And so... Even in Jeremiah, when he speaks about God's faithfulness and the future um, realization of God's plans and the covenant with Israel, again, the word loving kindness we find back. Also in a day of recovery in the kings, as we find later on in Second Chronicles, we find the same expression back. This is wonderful to see how it is based on God's loving kindness. And then, again, in verse 35, you see, it was a preview because they cry here, save us, O God of our salvation. Here you see a preview in connection with the future remnant. They will cry to God that they may be gathered. The ten tribes may be gathered and be delivered. So, again you see here an illustration of things which will be realized in the future. But we may look already now up to God. We are also dependent 
It's not here the salvation of our souls, but we need to be dependent on the Lord for every day that he would protect us and save us from wrong influences. So, at the end it says, Blessed be Jehovah, the God of Israel, from eternity and to eternity. And all the people said, Amen. This is wonderful to see how all the people is involved. We, I forgot to mention that in chapter 15, when the ark was brought there, it says in verse 28, and all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of Jehovah. God wants to see his whole people involved in this exercise. It's not just for an elite, it's for the whole people of God. On the other hand, we see it's only a remnant. But the remnant counts for God as his whole people. That is the other side, because they take the ground of the whole people. Although it's only a small remnant who realizes, which realizes this. It's in the days of the Lord Jesus when all the people was baptized in Luke 3 that he came there. It was not the whole people, but they, the remnant, they counted for God as the whole people. And so it will be with Israel, the remnant will be saved, all Israel will be saved. So he will see the people of God in connection with the ark, in connection with giving him his, doful, uh, du- uh, his place. Now we come to verse 37. And again, you see, there is a day of transition. There was a very strange situation. Now, the ark was on Mount Zion, and the sacrifices, they uh, were uh, sacrificed on Gibeon, on the height. We have to remind ourselves the fact that um, the place, the former place, Shiloh, where the tabernacle was, had been destroyed by the Philistines and the Amorites, probably. And so, some... um, Something had been brought now to Gibeon, a place where King Saul also had um, his reign. Or perhaps we can link it with the Gibeonites you find in Joshua 9, who had been treacherous. They had made this covenant with Joshua. They had deceived Joshua and the elders. But because of the promise, because of this oath, they had their share in the service of God. They would be uh, carriers of water and cutters of wood. And so perhaps they were the ones who had salvaged the parts of the tabernacle when the attack of the Philistines took place. We don't know. But at least we find here a kind of confusing situation. You can see this is not God's ideal. It's still a day of transition. But in many ways we have a similar situation. That we have to face things that we say this is not the ideal situation. But then let's be patient. We will see how this will be worked out in this book later on. Um, So we find on the one hand, the priest before the ark, and we have noticed how important this service is, and I want you to notice here, in verse 37, continually they were there, every day's duty, as every day's duty required. And I want to underline this, because are our eyes directed on the Lord Jesus from morning to evening? Everything we do is in connection with the ark, my job, my family. Do we, do we give him his rightful place? So the ark has something to do with our everyday life. And then when it comes to the offerings, we find Heman and Jeduthun, and also the musical instruments. And I want to underline something I forgot to mention tonight, but I think I mentioned last time. One of the wonderful elements David introduced that under his leadership, the service of song was introduced and they could sing and also these musical instruments were used in connection with the ark so that is an element which was added under David's leadership that was not known before there was something new but it was entirely according to God's uh, thoughts so when we come to chapter 17 now we find another important issue we have been speaking about the house this leads us to the next chapters about the house of God. So we have seen the man of God's choice, the anointed one, chosen one, who would bring the ark among the people of God, Mount Zion, and now we find how he starts to speak about God's house. Okay, so you see how things follow up. But, I just mentioned there are three houses. David dwelt in his own house. Chapter 17, verse 1. In the house of cedars. And then his desire is that there would be a house for God. It's similar we had in Exodus 15 and in Exodus 25 and so on. The people would prepare a place for the Lord to dwell. That was according to God's heart. No question about that. 
But then, what does God say to the prophet in verse 4? Say to David, thou shalt not build me a house. Why is this? Was it not the rightful desire? Was it not really good what David wanted? You see, what David had to learn, he had to become a receiver first. God is a great giver. And what does God say in verse 10? I will build the house. God is the great giver. God is the one who will take care of this uh, idea. And so God is the great builder. And connect this again with the New Testament. God is the great giver. He has given his own son. He would build a house. The one who would come from David's uh, loins, Solomon, he would build the temple. But he is only an illustration of the true son, the true seed of David. He would build a house. And as I mentioned earlier, in connection with him, all God's promises will be fulfilled. The Lord Jesus is the great builder then. And that brings us to our days. Because the Lord says in Matthew 16, This is, um, on this rock I will build my assembly. There we see the great builder. And even in days of ruin where we are in 2 Timothy 2, still the house is there, the foundation is there. And so we can maintain God's thoughts even in a day of ruin. But we have to understand that it is on the basis of God's intervention. God gave a house to David. God gave a seat. God would build a house to David. That means he would give him descendants. And this descendant would build the temple. So it is God who does it. And that's wonderful to see how these two elements go together. On David's side there was this desire. And that was perfectly right. But David had to understand. Even when I desire this to do, I can't. And so then God comes in, and it is on the basis of God's grace. God is the great giver. And about the one who God will give, that these things can be realized. And that is important for us to understand. If we would bring uh, into practice the teaching of the New Testament in connection with the house of God, we have to understand it's not because we want it. It's not because our efforts. It is because of the Lord Jesus whom God has given. So, in verse... Um, 5 and 6 God reminds David of his grace God says you know don't bother too much because I have always identified myself in the condition where my people was so if they didn't have a palace to live in I just lived with them in a tent they were in tents I was in a tent so that is God's grace God's condescending grace how he would come down on the level where his people is and may I just um, elaborate a little bit on this God knows where you are, where I am. God knows exactly where. And he would come right where you are. Don't you see it in Exodus 3? The people was in distress. They were in bondage under, the, under Pharaoh. And what does God do? God dwells in the thorn bush. He just dwells there where the people is. When you read Isaiah 63, in all their distress, the angel of his face, Jehovah himself, he was in distress. He is where his people is. So that is God's grace on the one hand. But then God would say, but then I'll take you and I'll bring you where I am. That is exactly what we have in this, this chapter. On the one hand, God was with his people in their, in their afflictions. But now God says, I'll bring you in my house. And I use David's seed for that. To establish this house, to build this house. And so we are introduced then into God's presence to be where he wants to dwell. So, on the one hand, he is with us where we are. On the other hand, he wants us to bring in his house where he wants to dwell. And he uses for this exercise, he uses David, that's what we have in verse 7. He took David from the sheep. And by the way, this is God's ideal of a king, a shepherd king. We find it already in uh, the book of Genesis, many examples where the shepherd is really the man of God's choice. I refer to Exodus 3, there you see Moses, who was the man of God's choice. He was a shepherd, and he became the leader, later on the king in Israel, in Yeshurun. John 10, the Lord Jesus, he is the good shepherd. He is the one who will have this leadership, who has lordship and headship. And we find this also wonderful in the Psalms, Psalm 22, the good shepherd who gives his life. Psalm 23, the shepherd who is with us right now where we are. But Psalm 24, there we see the shepherd king. He is introduced there in the midst of his people in Jerusalem. 
Now we come to verse 9. I will appoint a place for my people Israel. Again, it's a matter of God's choice, of God's appointment. And again, of course, we can re, uh, link this with the future day, with the millennium. But then in verse 10, I will subdue all thine enemies, and I will tell that Jehovah will build thee a house. Here, as I said earlier, God is the great giver. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So God is the great giver. God is not in debt towards David. God will be the great giver. And David can receive. So it is with us. And then he will set up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons. In this passage, there is no condition. It is unconditional promises. And we see it fulfilled in the New Testament. Matthew 1, the son of David. Romans 1, on the one hand, after the flesh, David's seed. On the other hand, God declared in righteousness, in resurrection. So, here we find David's seed on a new foundation in connection with resurrection. That is the foundation God has laid. It is, verse 12, it is he who shall build me a house. On the one hand, in connection with Israel, literally, and in connection with us now, as I quoted from Matthew 16, he is the great builder. And I will establish his throne forever. He will, I will build his, excuse me, I will be his father and he shall be my son. So here we have the close relationship between God and the son of David. And we know from the New Testament how this is. Because this son is the son of God. There we have this intimate relationship. But on the other hand, he is also the seed of David. So, God bypasses failure. There is much failure, and we can see it in David's history, but God is here on the line of his purpose. And uh, he says, as I took it from him that was before thee. You see, Saul, God took it away. God could not be on the line of Saul. God is on the line of David, despite his failures. God is going to fulfill his plans. Now, verse 14, I will settle him in my house. You see, here again it is in connection with what is for God. I will settle him in my house. David was speaking about his house. David was speaking about the house that he would build. But now God speaks about my house. When you compare this with 2 Samuel 7, the same passage, it is about David's house and about David's kingdom. But here we see how God sees the things from his perspective. It's my house, it's my kingdom. Notice here again that the priest, the priestly house, and the royal house, they come together. And then verse 15, according to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak to David. Now, notice the response. How does David respond, respond to this? Is that not wonderful to see? You see, what God works out in David here, God wants to work out in your life and my life. God wants us to be also seed of David. As we are seed of Abraham, Abraham is the father of all believers, in that sense, you and me, we are believe, uh, seed of Abraham, Romans 4. But God wants us to be also seed of David. That we would promote God's rights in this world. That was David's exercise. And so, I think what we can learn from David, the exercise he had, as we have noticed last time, Psalm 132, that would be my exercise, that would be our exercise. That is what God wants to see now, in, in, in a moral way, that we would be seed of David in that sense. Have God's interests at heart and so also to be able to respond in such a way as David does here now in verse 16 and onward so we find here appreciation for God's thoughts uh, we find here total submission to God's will and God's purpose there's no interference on behalf of David he accepts it with gladfulness with glad heart he bows under God's uh, plans and this reminds us then, I, I want uh, to remind us also of the Lord Jesus. Um, before I forget, I want to quote that verse because it is very beautiful. In Luke 1, there we have this um, message from the angel to Mary. And Mary was a descendant uh, through uh, David's son Nathan, not the prophet Nathan, but David's son Nathan, Mary was a descendant of David, and it says in Luke 1, verse 30, Thou hast found favor with God, 
Verse 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in the womb, and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Verse 32, He shall be great, and shall be called Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of David his father. So you see here, it's really the Lord Jesus who is the seed of David. Solomon is a type of the Lord Jesus. But here we have the true seed of David. He shall be great and shall be called son of the highest. And what I want to suggest now to you, in a moral sense, we all may be seed of David when we promote these things, when we acknowledge the Lord's greatness and bow for him and give him his dutiful place. Then we are, in that sense, seed of David. So when we turn back just a few moments to uh, 1 Chronicles 17, how is David amazed? Who am I, Jehovah Elohim? David has become a receiver, and he accepts it. He is amazed. What is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? How we can speak with, Mo- with uh, David these words? So you find a humble attitude. Great David is very humble in God's presence. How this behoves us too, to be found in God's sight in this way. To have fellowship. He sat there before God. That's so wonderful. He was seated in God's presence. And he communicated with God in this way. Wonderful to see this. And that is what God has in mind for you. You need to have fellowship like, like this. And uh, when we come to verse 19, we see how David would remember the past and uh, speak about God's graciousness, what God had done according to his own heart. I underline that God is dealing here with things according to his heart. David was the man after God's heart. David would fulfill everything according to God's thoughts. And that is what we find here in verse 19. He is moving on that line of God's desires. And uh, on the other hand, also as a receiver. That goes together. He is the one who receives now because he is on God's line. In verse 20, he gives... uh, Praise to God, and there we have the uniqueness of God. Even the God of the Old Testament, none like thee. When you come to the Father in the New Testament, none like the Father, none like the Lord Jesus. So the uniqueness of God is is really something we understand, how unique God is, how great he is. Then when we come to verse 21, okay, just one thing, at the end of verse 20, according to all that we have heard with our ears, how important it is to hear with our ears. In 1 John 1, what we have heard. And then also verse 21, here we see the uniqueness of redemption. Verse 21, who is like thy people Israel? And we can say, who is like the church today? A redeemed people of God. How great is God's redemption? How great is he himself? But also how great is redemption? In verse 21. And this was for himself. Put this aside, Ephesians 1 verse 6. God has adopted us to be sons for himself. Do you realize that God wants to have us for himself? Every believer here, young and old, we are here for himself. We are not here for us, for our uh, pleasure, for our desires. We are here for him, for his interests. Then verse 22, the uniqueness of God's people. What does it say in verse 22? Thy people Israel has thou made thine own people forever it's not only that we individually belong to him but the whole people of God belongs to him forever you can find it in many places in the scriptures God has prepared Israel for his own praise and so he has prepared the church for his own glory but also to have this relationship what do we read in verse 22 and thou Jehovah art become their God God wants to have a relationship with each one of us as he had with David here when he was found in his presence. And so the desires of God's heart are met here by David's response. Wonderful fellowship, wonderful relationship. Of course, in connection with Israel, it is from the foundation of this world. In connection with the church, it is in connection with God's counsel from before the foundation of the world, which we see now in connection with Christ in the glory. So then he speaks about God's faithfulness, verse 24. Let it even be established. The word established is from the word in the Hebrew, what we find back in Amen, the word Amen. 
It has to do with God's faithfulness. It's through God's faithfulness that these things will be realized. Read Psalm 89. Wonderful to see God's faithfulness. And let thy name be magnified. So, he starts to pray now. He wants God to know.